probably the most important slide on here. One of the things that I do want to say is we've all been in a different time period. We've all had uh, our everybody's world kind of turn upside down in March. But one thing that I would like the, you to know is the home base team wishes you and your family a very happy Thanksgiving and a happy holidays moving in. And I hope you have some time next week to take take a few days and spend some time with yourself and with your family and just get some rest because I know we've all been working extremely hard. Thank you very much. And next slide, please. And there is our wonderful home base team. We do have the addition of Russell Dixon, who's going to help us with the power school upgrades. But as I always like to end my part of the slideshow with in our presentation, please make sure you know we are here for you. We are very thankful to be here serving you and to help you make these products successful every day for the kids of North Carolina. For that, I appreciate the work you do and letting us be your partner working with you towards that goal. With that, I'm gonna turn it back over to John. Thank you very much, John, and have a good day, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Dietrich. So I'm going to shift gears here real quick to the school net slide deck um, again you can get to that by clicking the link back on slide 15 of our opening slides or i will also drop this bitly directly to the school net deck into the chat so that will be there for you as well all right um, and as Dr. Dietrich said, welcome to WebEx. Um, so if you have questions, you are welcome to put those in through the Q&A. Um, you can also interact with us through the chat. Um, we'll be keeping an eye on that throughout the morning. And if we haven't met yet, I'm John Mars, your SchoolNet product manager and home-based trainer in the Digital Teaching and Learning Division here at NCDPI. And you are always welcome to contact me through the two methods below there. Um, I will note my phone is sometimes a little flaky. So if you don't get me by phone, please send me an email and I will get right back to you. So on deck for today, we have a couple of home base updates, some usage updates, and then I will turn it over to the wonderful Catherine from Pearson to give us a peek at some upcoming features in 22.1, which is the winter release for this year, um, as well as some NCFE updates, and then we'll wrap up with networking and Q&A. So as far as home base updates go, um, I did want to draw attention to the slightly revamped SchoolNet Google site. Um, Pam had a great SchoolNet Google site out there, and I made just a few little tweaks, um, most specifically to the documents and webinars pages both, um, and those are both directly linked there for you. Um, so the home page is pretty much the same. The webinars page I redesigned a little bit with upcoming webinars here on the left um, and direct registration links. Then on the right, you will always have the recording of the most recent webinar, and you can always click out to view the YouTube playlist through any of these three links. The documents page, um, I added quite a bit to it. So I went through and found every single school net help document that I could possibly find here at DPI and listed them all here for you with links and ditto for training presentations. So these are all the presentations that Pam had and all the ones that I've made so far. You can always find listed here and you are welcome to take these presentations and adapt them for yourself, use them however you can use them. Um, this is all here for you. Um, I also wanted to throw out there, um, so we, we have some great participation in our monthly school net webinars. Um, something that we've started trying for Canvas and Go Open NC has been some sort of self-paced, but still interactive Canvas courses in place of those webinars. Um, Pam did that last month for her two products, Canvas and Go Open. Um, I'm thinking maybe we should go that way for SchoolNet as well. 
Um, so if you do have any, you know, thoughts on that one way or another, please feel free to throw those in the chat, or we also have a little padlet coming up here. Um, but basically how that would look is on, you know, whatever date we would set as the release date, you would then be able to access a small canvas course designed to be completed in about an hour, um, through Nisus and through canvas. Um, and that would automatically grant a teacher or administrator a CEU credit upon completion. Um, so kind of what we've been thinking about, but let, let us know if you have any thoughts. Um, I also wanted to throw out there, we do are working on the contract extension for SchoolNet. Um, so rest assured, it will be there for you. Um, we do have a few CTE updates on the horizon. As always, there will be a few tweaks coming. And the big one I'm kind of excited about, we are underway with testing for version 22.1, and we are targeting early 2021 for that upgrade as usual, if you're used to the school net release cycles. So that is coming up soon, and Catherine will be telling us more about that here soon. Um, so on that note, I did want to take a moment to pause and just do a quick Padlet activity to, to kind of feel out the room, as it were. Um, so I have four columns on there. Um, if you choose, feel free to give us an introduction or just some general good news, um, you know, whether about SchoolNet or just personally. Um, always good to hear good things. Um, and then any school net successes or any school net challenges this year and anything you'd like NCDPI to review. Um, so I will drop this link in the chat as well, but we'll pause here for a few minutes just to kind of grab you guys' feedback. You're glad you could join us this morning. So I see we definitely maybe have a little frustration with Canvas school net. Um, it might be something we can talk about a little bit um, and sharing assessments across a district, especially with virtual learning. Let's see, Sherry has an elementary jumping on the school net bandwagon this year. That's awesome. Creating their common assessments. I like that. I'm not even going to read that jinx one, but <laughs> happy to hear for you. So I'm going to go ahead and, and start rolling on, but please feel free as we go along. You know, if there's especially if there there's something you hear that you're like, wait a minute, what is that? Feel free to throw it in my action items column here um, so we can make sure that we are supporting you and giving you what you need. Um, as you guys wrap that up, I did want to share just some quick updated usage numbers with you. Um, so the total number of assessments submitted so far this year, this numbers as of about, you know, I think it was about 8 30, 9 o'clock this morning, I pulled these numbers. Um, so we are closing in on 3.3 million submitted assessments this year. Um, that honestly is a little bit behind where we were at this time last year. Um, but in talking about it and looking at the numbers, we are kind of in between September and October numbers of last year. And given the later start date and some of the challenges posed by COVID, we feel like this is probably about where we should expect to be. Um, but again, certainly any thoughts on that, please feel free. Um, of those. 3.2 some million submitted assessments, 14,306 of those are one of our state recommended assessments this year. So the math sets, the Certica testlets in ELA math, and the NCFEs. Um, and breaking that number down just a little bit, most of those are math sets submissions. But we also have some released math and science submissions and a good handful of Certica testlet submissions as well. Um, we haven't seen any NCFE submissions just yet, 
but I know I have heard from a good number of you who are in the planning phases for those. Um, so that said, I also wanted to kind of open it up if you want to throw this in the Padlet or in the chat. Um, but let us know, have you used the new state benchmarks in SchoolNet, any of them, whether the NCFEs or the Certica testlets or the release tests? Um, you know, let us know if you've used those or if you've had challenges with those or maybe it's something you just want to save for later. Um, but I will say I was very excited to to see that we have those this year and hopefully that's something that will continue to be available. And with that said, I'll let you guys marinate on that one a little bit. Um, but that brings us up to the wonderful Catherine's portion um, on SchoolNet 22.1. So I will turn it over to you, Catherine. Thanks, John. Good morning, everyone. Um, happy Thanksgiving coming up. Um, glad so many of you could make it today. Um, Looking at the number of participants, where uh, we have a lot of people today, I have uh, Lisa with me today, um, so she'll be fielding your questions in the chat and also the Padlet. Um, so hopefully, as they pertain to the topics that we're going to discuss, we can um, answer some of your questions. Um, feel free to jump in and ask anything you like. Um, next slide, John. Thanks. So I put a link here to the uh, training site logins. The training site has already, as John mentioned, been upgraded to 22.1. Uh, so uh, anything you see here in our slide deck uh, presentation of 22.1, you can try out in the training site. Um, feel free to send myself, Lisa, or John feedback on any of the features. Um, I will admit that Lisa and I are still in the testing process. So, um, uh, you know, we're trying to uh, check out every little nook and cranny of the new update. Okay. So, if you have any questions with that, um, let me know. Next slide, John. Okay, so uh, we'll start with some of the reporting updates that are coming in 22.1. Uh, um, first is a student response extract, and the second is an analysis spreadsheet for a test. Um, so I'll give you a little detail on those. John, next slide. Thanks. Okay, so when you go to a uh, particular test um, and in the um, reporting dashboard or uh, you have now have the ability to basically print out what looks like an item analysis report um, for individual students. So let me give you a use case before I, I go into the click path of this. Um, I, I've had districts ask me about um, what can I send home to parents? Um, you know, before we would give paper tests and we'd get the parents to sign to acknowledge that they saw um, the students' scores, et cetera. Um, these uh, response extracts can be printed in bulk or for individual students. Um, if they're printed in bulk, they come out in little strips and they can be cut to give to students. Um, I can also see um, I am reviewing a test um, together with my class and each student is able to review um, their strips uh, for the response extract. So these are able to be uh, printed out. Um, it comes out as a PDF um, and it's available for teachers or for um, leadership and it's accessed through the reporting dashboard. Um, the test summary for a single section or by the student profile under the benchmark um, or classroom test tab um, for each student. Uh, the specific step-by-step -step directions uh, when you have the slide deck are in the notes of the slide deck, so you can always go back and reference those um, to click for the click pass. 
Any questions about the um, student response extract? Sorry, John. <laughs> Okay, the next one is um, the analysis spreadsheet for a test. Um, in the past, we would create uh, these as a custom report. And um, my experience with this, with an analysis spreadsheet report is a district or a school would want to pull information uh, such as um, special ed, uh, possibly um, uh, anything, that race, et cetera, um, region or um, a specific school. Now the report is automatic. So when you um, go to, when you generate this report, again, from the reporting dashboard um, at the district, school, or section level, you can report it. Um, Again, it's permission based. So if you are a teacher running this report, you will only see students that you have permission to view. Um, and when you uh, run this analysis spreadsheet, it'll give you the, uh, the sorry, the score group for the student um, for the test, the proficiency level, um, and the percent correct. You can certainly hide any of the columns um, if you know they're not something that you would like to view. Um, you can sort by the columns. Um, let's say we're going to look at the score groups. We can sort uh, low to high, high to low, um, and then in this manner uh, group the students based on a particular assessment. Any questions? Um, and I do want to throw out real fast um, that yes. in North Carolina Production School Net, we don't have special ed in there currently. Correct. I'm sorry. Um, my and lunch status, I, I can say, will definitely never be in there. Special ed, I'm, I've got some questions to ask about. Lunch status certainly won't be. No, Just lunch status is, is definitely not in there. Um, sorry, this was a screenshot from the 22 release, um, but the other columns will display um, for this particular report. Thank you, John, for the clarification. Okay. So the next uh, updates that we have, um, oh, I'm sorry, additional enhancements. My mistake um, was waiting for them. There, the summary statistics, statistics report is now exportable to Excel. Um, previously, this report was only available in a PDF, so now you have the ability to export it into Excel. Um, and the um, the um, sorry, the PDF export there there was a minor piece where the title was cut off, so they've fixed that. Uh, just a little tweak on that particular one, so just a minor update for those. Uh, the next set of uh, updates um, are pertain to the assessment, uh, scheduling, co-author, duplicating items on an assessment, and also item banks. All right. Sorry, I was just looking at the chat the whole time. Uh, so I actually tested this piece out and I love it. Um, I have scheduled numerous tests um, for lots of different districts, and um, most recently, the state assessments for North Carolina. And as most of you'll know, you have to go into the um, scheduling options and the pieces that uh, testing results and scheduling, um, testing access. Uh, one thing uh, when I schedule a test that I always like to check the box, um, is to track and display student response times. Uh, some people always choose scramble the uh, test responses, etc. cetera. Um, the, um, this can now be set as a template so that if you are scheduling multiple tests, uh, you see in that top right screenshot number with the number one in blue there um, and the number two in red, uh, you can apply the test options that you've chosen from a particular test um, 
to your personal template so that when you open another test to schedule, it'll save all your previous choices. Um, you can edit the template at any time. So if you need to change it, um, there's a little checkbox where the, um, if you see the red one there in the circle, um, if you set the options as your personal template or you don't have to, um, but then you save and publish. So uh, this is a time saver. Um, if you are um, the person in your district scheduling multiple tests, um, and you'll see in a minute, if you're scheduling district tests, it's going to link to test windows on the next slide. Um, so I'll talk about that. Um, and if you have any questions, certainly drop them in the chat or um, the Q&A um, there. Uh, next slide, John. So this, uh, the district test windows, uh, actually, as I mentioned, goes hand in hand with the previous slide. You can set up uh, testing windows by date. And uh, so, for instance, you have a fall benchmark assessment, you have a, maybe a winter be benchmark assessment, and a spring. Um, you can preset the testing windows and the dates. Um, that way, if you are scheduling, let's say, uh, kindergarten through eighth grade uh, or 12th grade even um, for math, um, when you go to schedule the test, you can just link it to the test window. The dates will automatically be applied. And if you also apply your personal template, you're going to have two clicks and then you can schedule the test. Um, rather than going into each of those options and choosing your preferences for each test that you go to schedule. So again, this is um, definitely another time saver um, when it comes to scheduling tests. If you are the person in your district that's responsible for um, scheduling numerous tests. And pause there for a minute. Any questions on that one? Comments? And Lisa, I hope you're keeping me honest because I'm not looking at the chat um, with um, any questions anyone has. So far, so good. All right, great. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, the next option when scheduling a test is to allow students to resume a test. Um, so use cases for this, um, I've, I've heard uh, through cases that have been submitted, um, students uh, taking a test um, rather than submitting the test. Um, I did have one high school um, that uh, relayed that a student was not submitting the test and then they would, you know, go to a different class to resume it, to uh, go back into the test. So now when you're scheduling it, you're going to see a little bit different. You always had the option to allow students to pause the test. Um, now you're um, going to have a checkbox that uh, gives you the option, and all again, this is all in the scheduling page, um, that allows you to re, uh, students to resume a started test. So if this box is checked, then a student can pause, and a, you also click the pause test. The student can pause the test and um, at any time uh, put the passcode back in to their take a test widget, and then they can resume the test. If it is not checked and you are restricting their access to resume a test, then the teacher would. Um, if the student did not submit the test and needs to go back into the test, um, you see from the proctor dashboard, you have the option. Um, there is a new column um, that says allow resume. You just click yes, and the student can then go to the take a test widget, put the passcode back in and resume the test. If the student has not submitted um, and you're not permitting them to resume the test, you always and still have the option to uh, submit the test for them. 
what will be the default question, uh, default setting? Good question. Um, it is not checked, but you can select it as your personal template for scheduling, um, and then it would be part of the default setting. Um, if that's something, if everyone would like it um, set as the default, I can certainly look into that. Um, but again, it can be set in your personal template um, to to schedule test. Just reopen. Sorry. I was writing that down so I remember to look into that. Thank you, James, for that question. Um, okay. In the Proctor dashboard, yes. So the question is, um, If the teacher does doesn't set allow resume, will will the allow resume toggle button always be available for the teacher in the Proctor dashboard? Yes. Uh, well, let me clarify that we do have uh, state tests that have restrictions on them. Um, so if there is a restriction, then and that has been, and we're not allowing teachers to resume the test, then they wouldn't have that option. Uh, the de I think, James, the default for pausing right now is it's not checked. If I'm, I don't know if anyone, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm working off a of memory for that. I would need to log in and double check that. Um, but I can certainly, um, let you know about those defaults. Um, yes, John, I, I believe that it correct. You're correct that it the pause is unchecked right now, um, but a new personal template would would definitely uh, correct that. So you can choose whatever you want. I'm sorry, Kathy Williams. I'm I'm confused. The one question: If a teacher doesn't allow resume, will building um, oh, is that while building the test? Oh, when building the test. Thank you for the clarification. Um, it's not in the building of the test. It's in the scheduling of the test. Just to be clear. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, I'm trying to read the chat and the and the uh, PowerPoint at the same time. Okay, good, good dialogue on that. Any other questions um, regarding the resume? Just remember, all of these check boxes, um, whether they are defaults or they are not defaults, you can make them your default setting with your personal scheduling template. Okay. All right. Great. Uh, next slide, John. Okay, so other scheduling options. Um, these didn't really warrant a screenshot. Um, one uh, question or suggestion that has come up previously is that um, in an ELA test or social studies test, when uh, there are multiple items and passages. So let's say we have three passages and each passage has four to five questions. When we scheduled that test, if we had chosen the scramble question order content previously, it may or may not put passage one and a question then passage two and a question, then passage three and a question, and then mix them up. Now uh, it will keep 
all the items associated with the passage in order, but the questions for that particular passage will be scrambled um, for the students when they take the test. Um, so a little clean up on that one um, because that was a little bit troublesome previously. And I know a lot of people had uh, discontinued using the scramble the items on, an, on a test with passages. Um, the next option when scheduling a test, um, and I do like this one, um, I have to tell you, um, previously uh, on when a student logged in to take a test and they would go to the take a test widget, um, they would put the passcode in and then they could potentially see multiple uh, sections, um, classes that are taking. And if they wanted to, let's say it's an ELA test, they could select their math section and then the results would then go to that section. Um, now, when scheduling a test, you have the ability to disable the student's ability to select a section. Um, and that way they cannot change the section. Um, and then therefore the results would Car correspond to um, an ELA class, to uh, ELA data, math, and math uh, type of scenarios. Um, if there's a couple scenarios there, if the student has no sections for which the test is scheduled, then they can select any of their sections. Um, so just a couple more options when you are um, scheduling tests there, okay? Okay, next one. Okay, I did see a couple of questions in the Padlet. Uh, I'm just gonna, about sharing assessments. Um, so I am guessing that um, a teacher created assessment and they are trying to co-author it with another building. Um, I don't know if I'm able to see who posted these or, um, but it's the first under school net challenges. And then it's also number two, I think, on the Padlet. So um, if, if you've opened up a service now case, I can look into that um, to see where the difficulties occurring. You should be able to enter the name of uh, last name, first um, of the person or teacher uh, in another building that you wish to share an assessment with. Um, another option, um, which I, I always recommend, is to create a co-author folder. And um, that way you can add people to the folder um, and drop any co-authored test into the folder. So let's see. Um, we have found that even if a test is created as a shared assessment, it is... Okay, so we're not talking about co-authoring with that question. Um, uh, I'm guessing, James, that, Jamie, that that category you're using is a like a school common is that what you're referring to or lisa you're chiming in on this yeah um, <laughs> good morning everybody I, I was looking i kind of interpreted maybe i'm wrong um, were they trying to share it with one of their virtual locations and if so it could be a matter of the, you know the way the sections were assigned or the rights in power school um but but exactly catherine the the easiest way is to co-author, put it in a folder, and then add the names to the folder, and then everyone can visit the folder and make a copy and then assign it to their sections. That's probably the easiest solution to work around. But I'm not sure. I can't see who actually posted this question. Um, I, I didn't see it on the Padlet, but I have Jamie Curtis um, posting the first question. Yeah, but if you would like, um, you can 
you can either email or send um, put in a service now ticket with some specifics and we can definitely troubleshoot it for you. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, thanks, Drew. Co-author folder works great. Yes, James, I 100% agree. When you are trying to share across schools or districts, it does, it because there are so many different users in the home base site, it does take a while for the names to appear. Um, so um, give yourself, if you're setting up those co-author folders, uh, as Lisa said, it will definitely save you time in the future. Um, but once you go through that process of adding the names to the co-author folder, um, then you don't have to keep searching for people's names. Um, right, and always search um, their, however their name is in PowerSchool, not a nickname, so it's last name and then their, their first name and not, you know, for Elizabeth, if it's Elizabeth in Power School, then you need to search by Elizabeth and not Liz or Beth or or um, what have you. And Pam also shared in the chat that um, when you create a, a shared assessment, this is when you would typically need um, that additional permission in Power School in addition to the teacher role um, access to share assessments, I believe. So that yes. could be an issue. Okay, great. Thank you for all your questions on that and input. Appreciate it. So um, along those lines, the new enhancements on the 22-1, um, when you create a test and you co-author the test um, and you've shared it to the folder or to another user, um, the new updates when uh, the co-author test now opens in view only mode. Um, so what you're going to see are a couple new buttons and you see the screenshots of them on um, the slide deck currently. So we have um, first and prominently, and I love this feature, just have to tell you, <laughs> the copy button at the top is very prominent. Um, so uh, if you're, taking the test as is, um, you're, you're accepting it, the co-author, you have the copy button right there at the top um, to copy it so that you can make your own edits if need be or move forward. That's assuming the person that co-authored it, um, that's, you have that ability um, when they share that. The next screen uh, shot if the person that co-authored it with you gave you edit rights, you're going to see two buttons. You're going to see the edit test button, which when you click that, you now have the ability to, um, you know, modify the questions. So this scenario is uh, Lisa and I are working on a test together. Um, I input 10 questions. Um, I co-author with her. She's going to review my 10 questions and um, add her own questions. Uh, so she would then uh, use the edit button there. Um, and finally, you're also going to see um, when the test is in edit mode, if um, Lisa were editing and I attempt to go back in, I'm going to see uh, that the test is in edit mode. And before Lisa finish, when Lisa finishes, she's going to uh, click that uh, button that says she's finished editing this test, and then I can then go into the test. Um, so just a couple enhancements on um, the way uh, you can access and utilize um, co-author tests to make it a little bit easier. I know in the past, um, you know, we, we would hear, uh, I can't, get to that test or I can't use that test. Now you have the view only option and also the edit option for co-authoring. So hopefully that makes it a little bit easier um, for those of you using this feature. Any questions on that one? Okay. Um, 
The next one uh, speaks to item creation. Um, I wish we had this feature probably about five years ago um, when I was steady making math tests. Uh, but uh, this particular feature is duplicating an item on a test. So um, whether you pull an item from the bank or you create your own item, you are now going to see um, the link uh, right there at the top in the item uh, formatting page that says duplicate. So um, I'll give you an example of what I used when I was testing this feature. Went in the training site, I pulled a couple third grade math problems and one of them happened to, it was multiple choice and it happened to have images of um, uh, shapes that were for fractions that were divided into quarters, halves, eighths, and then they were shaded. The original question said, um, select the uh, shape uh, that has one fourth shaded. Fine, like that question. I duplicated it. I changed the question to say, choose the shape that has one half shaded and change the answer choice. Duplicated it again, change the question, one eighth, you get the idea. Um, so it was a quick way without actually creating the item or searching another item up. Um, I'm just going to give a little exit ticket on one standard and I'm going to change it up a little bit. And now I have the ability to duplicate my items. Um, so I was kind of a fan of that one. Um, any questions on that? All right. The next slide has to do with um, item banks. Okay, I did see a couple of questions in the Padlet. I'll go to those in a minute um, regarding item banks. Um, but now, if you are creating your own items and saving your items to a bank and you have permission rights for those items, you now have the ability to bulk update the item properties. Um, so you can select um, one, two, three items or all items in a particular bank and you can edit them. Uh, under the edit button, the uh, properties that you have the ability to edit are things like DOK, um, author, publisher, um, Basically, when you create an item and you see item properties, any of those uh, categories listed under the item properties is when uh, or what you would be able to bulk uh, update. The other feature that goes hand in hand with this is the ability to, let's say you've created items and uh, you no longer wish to use them. Um, previously, you had to delete them one by one. Um, trust me, it's a very time consuming process, but now you can um, choose multiple items and delete them at the same time. Please be aware that if you delete items, um, they're not able to be retrieved. So use this with um, definitely with some caution. Um, let's see, I had it. I know there was questions on this. We had individuals. Go ahead. Question Please. with the item banks in the standards not being aligned. So I'm not sure if this relates to CTE items or exactly what they were trying to say. This is any recent news only can questions to standards and objectives. I have two item banks that are not available for teacher use because of the updated core standards. And yes, they just said through through chat that was specific to CTE. Okay. Okay. Um, at this time, I do not have an update on that. Um, I know that uh, I am waiting on a copy down of those items from production. Um, 
I am also working with the CTE folks to have um, a, a plan in place when the standards change again this summer. And um, although I'm not aware of the details yet, um, I have been told there will be some new functionality involved in the uh, 23.0 update that will make this a little bit easier for us next year. So um, to be determined, but as far as the updates on those two banks, I am hoping that I will be able to access them in the DCT site um, in January. Um, I know it's, it's been a while um, that you've been waiting on that case, um, if it's the same person that submitted it. Um, so we haven't forgot about it. We are still working on it. Um, and again, I apologize for the delay. That was the only item bank one. Okay, in the Padlet, sorry. Okay, any questions about uh, bulk updating uh, item bank items? Okay. Uh, the next feature, just a small one um, related to um, searching by standards in the item banks. Um, if you are familiar with um, creating an assessment and you previously, in at, on that first screen, you set your standards template um, and then you search the bank, um, maybe you've chosen, um, can you, oh, there, sorry, yes. um, my mistake, I thought this slide was on a different slide. Um, you chose five or six standards in the template in the beginning, and then you go to search the item bank and all five standards show up. Now, when you get to the item bank, um, those five will be visible, but you will um, have the option to isolate the search at that point to one standard at a time to make it a little bit easier. Um, again, just an ease of use for that one. Um, so just a quick little update. On that. The next feature is um, for open response um, answer sheets. If you are using answer sheets um, for open response questions, there is now an option to have uh, college ruled or wide ruled line spacing. Um, and um, the answer key only. Uh, Test will also provide that, and the um, the item detail page properties. When you're creating this, you say uh, in the open response you're going to have properties, and then you're going to choose the type of uh, line there. Uh, if you go to the properties, you're going to see um, if you're unsure of what has been selected. You can always review it under item properties. Uh, it does default to the college ruled um, currently. So, okay. The next feature, again, if you are printing out uh, the test booklets, um, if you've ever done this, you're, you know that um, I always try to print my test bo booklets in Word and then I go back and manually remove all the little extra spaces so I don't have a nine page document. Um, so it's this enhancement has, for instance, you see on the left there before in a multiple choice question, you would see a lot of uh, extra spaces. And now on the right, it's um, condensed to reduce the amount of paper um, for that feature. Any questions on those? So that pretty much sums up the assessment enhancements. Um, I think, let me see what that one is. Just go through the thing. Um, I'm gonna go back to the Padlet. There was one other question about assessments. This came, this says district benchmark. I'd like those I've created to be visible to teachers so they can select and use. 
if they're not scheduled, then the teachers would not um, be able to see them. One option in the scheduling um, functionality is you could choose not to have the test display on the two students take a test widget and then um, the teacher, if she gives out, he or she gives out the passcode, then um, they can use the test, but the, the test would be available to all. If it's not scheduled and it's a district benchmark, um, that's probably your only option for teachers at this point. Um, unless I misread the question, I'm not sure who submitted that one. That question was from the feedback. I mean, from the Padlet, any feedback on that one? Uh, so they, they asked, it is scheduled, they can see it then, the teachers? Yes, yes. But students would see too, unless you check that box to hide it in the take a test widget. So they just wouldn't keep see that in mind. Yes, oh, okay. correct. Yep. yep. Cool. So hopefully that answers that one. Okay. I was trying to see if there Looks was like another follow up question for that one. Okay, great. Thank you. Yes, thanks, Pam. Um, someone else on this one is CT. Thank you. Okay. Okay, next feature. Um, this one does basically teacher use. Um, so I did test this out. Um, love this piece too. Um, I know maybe this one was highly requested from not just North Carolina, but almost everyone I know that uses this. Um, I am a um, teacher in a classroom and Lisa is my partner teacher. Um, Lisa is listed as the primary teacher for the section. And therefore, when I go into SchoolNet, I do not have access to the students in our shared class. Um, the current process and what will remain the initial first step is that you need to go into your account, collect uh, to sections and request access to the section. So I would put Lisa's name in, request access to her sections. And then um, so you always had that ability, but some of the issues that came up were that I was not able to assign a test of my own to this class. Um, I wasn't able to score the test for this class. Um, I wasn't able to view the Proctor dashboard. So now with 22.1, you will be able to, one, see the sections that you've uh, received permission to view um, on the My Sections widget. You will be able to go to the assessment monitoring widget um, on your home screen, um, look at all results for those students, access the students' um, profiles. You can assign a classroom test to those students um, or, sec or the entire section. You now have the functionality to score the test. Um, and to access the um, uh, Proctor dashboard and the functionality of that, resume the test, um, submit the test, et cetera. Uh, this is pretty big um, uh, feature as far as um, two teachers sharing the same section. Um, Try it out in trading. Uh, it works pretty good for me. So I was I was really thrilled with this update. Um, so um, again, this will be in January um, and hopefully uh, help out some of those tickets, ServiceNow tickets we've been getting with request for um, the primary and the secondary teacher in the room. Any comments or questions on that one? Okay, uh, going hand in hand with that is the next slide. Um, 
which is uh, the classroom assessment uh, monitor widget. And um, the look and feel of this is a little different. Uh, the classroom primary teacher or the co-teacher with access to the section will both see this in the same way. Um, so previously you had district and local tests, classroom tests, standardized tests. Uh, the na the uh, naming of the last tab has changed um, from upcoming tests to test management. So now you're basically going to see all the tests related to this um, particular section that you're viewing. And uh, as you can see, the, the color coding there, you're going to see if the test is in progress, if it's scheduled, if it's completed. Um, so you're going to see the test category. Um, again, that's also color coded. The passcode for the test, test name, the start and end date, and um, where you see number four there, uh, you get the drop down uh, where you get those features such as uh, proctor dashboard, scoring, view usernames, um, generate answer keys, download the test booklet for this particular test. So a lot cleaner in the view of this and hopefully a little bit easier for you to access and uh, manage there. Um, on a for the district and local test that you're only going to see the tests that are assigned to your sections. Um, there. Any questions about that one? All right, that pretty much covers all the 22 one updates. I'm just going back to the Padlet to see. Um, so there was one question on the Padlet that said issues with the Proctor dashboard with tests made by instructional coaches for a grade level. I'm not, if someone can provide some clarification, whoever submitted that in the chat uh, or the questions, maybe we can answer that. I think that's the only other assessment one, unless John or Lisa, you're seeing any others there. Not Seems sure quiet to me so far, and ho hopefully we can some more details on that one and circle back to it. Okay, sounds good. Thanks, John. Um, so I just wanted to talk about the um, the North Carolina final exams that we. Um, released um, since our last meetup and give some details on that. I know we've had a lot of questions um, surrounding these assessments and um, just uh, maybe hopefully provide some clarification. So um, there is a bank of items um, in production only, not training, um, that contains the items um, found on these exams. Those banks are only viewable to district leadership, not school level leadership, okay? Um, so these, if you were going to use those items um, to create your own assessments within your district, they would need to be pushed out from the district level. Um, just to clarify the bank um, first. The tests were reconstructed um, within SchoolNet and um, the following restrictions and scheduling have been um, enabled on them. Uh, so when um, they are recommended, so district leadership will need to schedule them. They cannot be scheduled from the school level unless the district level first recommends them down to the school or the teacher um, who can then schedule. The items um, are not viewable when you go to the test detail page, just to 
clarify that. Um, and they, the test will not display on the students take a test widget. So this was the feature that I was speaking about previously. If um, the district leadership does take the test and schedule it, um, and it's optional for teachers to administer, the it's not going to display when the student logs in. So they won't think they have an upcoming test. Um, these scheduling features cannot be edited by the district, just to make sure everyone's aware of that. Um, and it does not have the ability to link to Canvas. Um, and the reason for that is um, we are restricting copying of the test. Okay. Um, again, for edit, uh, for educators, you cannot view the item content. You cannot copy it. Um, you cannot edit or delete student responses. Um, we did not prevent scoring of open response questions. There are not open response questions on any of the tests except for the English three. Correct me if I said that wrong, John. I think that's right. Yes, that is correct. So the one open response question on the English three in CFE. And there is a rubric tied to that that we, we think gives enough detail to grade that response. Okay. Um, and of course, this, the restriction of viewing the test, um, uh, you can see the item analysis, the, uh, the data collection, um, the export, the test results, but you don't ever see the content of the test. So that the reporting features are not restricted for educators. Um, for students, again, they cannot see the item content or the answer choices. So the ability to review these tests with your students within SchoolNet um, is not an option. Okay. Um, any questions about those restrictions on those tests? Uh, some of the other considerations for these tests, um, text to speech was enabled for math, science, social studies tests only. Um, the reference sheets for the science, uh, I believe it's the high school science, um, an electronic copy was provided to the school net leads in your district. Um, we're adding the magnifier accommodation, the rubric for scoring on the ELA test that John mentioned. Um, the tests are not available for printing. Um, there's no time limit on the test. And the specific tests that require calculators, I believe it was the, again, the high school science, that was also enabled. Um, the following slide gives you a uh, summarized list of the test IDs, the test names, uh, those that have text to speech, the calculators that were enabled and the number of items on each particular assessment. Um, and I'll just throw out real quick that graphing calculator is a virtual TI. And I'm sorry, I'm going to jump back one. What was my other point? Oh, and the the reference sheets. So those are available to your testing coordinators in their secure shell. Um, but I also do have a copy of those reference sheets. So if you can't get them from your test coordinator for whatever reason and you need them, feel free to shoot me an email and I'll get that right to you. Great. Thanks, John. Um, and then the last slide rega regarding the final exams just gives you the count for the item banks that I was mentioning before. So the um, 647 items, 15 passages, they were shared um, to all opt-in districts and charters. If you do not have access, um, please let me know, Lisa or I know um, immediately. Um, I, I ran off a list. Um, these had to be shared individually. So definitely human error could have uh, come into play and I apologize for that, but I can fix it right away um, if you happen to be missing this bank. Again, you can only check if you are um, a district admin for those. Okay. 
and you would need a test item administrator at the district level to access those particular items. Any questions on the final exam items or tests? Did I miss anything, Lise? John? I don't believe so. Okay, did we get any clarification on that one Padlet? Um, no? Um, I don't see any yet. Okay, all right. Just wanted to Hopefully make sure we'll... I answered any of those. There's one Definitely. here, the last one, John, it says use with CDM would like ability to schedule assessments for students not enrolled in the subject for credit by demonstrated mastery phase one of assessments. I need help with that. Ah. <laughs> okay, so if I'm understanding the question right, you've got a student who is getting a credit by demonstrated mastery so therefore they're not enrolled in a class section that corresponds to the assessment you want to give um okay yes we got we got a clarification of yes in the the question so i think that they could take you could maybe do it as a school level benchmark that would that would let them take it without being enrolled into a class. Um, another idea that uh, I mean I don't love this idea, but if you have them enrolled in like a home room, correct, you could maybe administer that through home room. Um, it, it won't stop you from like say scheduling a math assessment in a home room or an ELA class. It'll kind of default and and shoot you away from that, but it, I don't think it'll actually stop you. No, uh, just make sure with 22.1, that feature about um, restricting students, uh, disabling the student section selection would come into play with this particular, if the student isn't enrolled in that course. That's the only thing that I can think of that might hold them up, um, but yeah, it's not good there point. now. Yep. Um, thanks for all of the comments in the school net successes. Um, I see that we're um, getting some extra use with some uh, expanding um, grade levels and some new schools um, coming into it. So uh, great, thank you very much for that. Appreciate it. Um, yes, the homeroom idea, but going back to the chat is a good one. Good. Sweet. Any other well, questions, thank you. comments? No? All right. Thanks, John. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you, Catherine. Um, and that brings us right up to our networking slash Q&A time. Um, so if there are any topics that you guys would like to discuss, um, this is kind of your time um, to let us know if there are any other topics we can cover with you guys today. Um, I will go ahead and unmute everybody, and uh, I'm going to say that again. Ho hopefully everyone hears me. I'm going to unmute everyone. Um, so if you do have something you'd like to discuss, please let us know. Um, and if you don't, please be ready to mute yourself. So here goes. Here goes. Attend. Oh, well. I think it was. Yeah, so that was That's what I thought that was the main thing. Yeah, I'm sensitive and I don't want to share. Yeah, no, you're not going to be satisfied until you do. No. So this time frame before is for the school year. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know that was embarrassing for felony. Yeah. That was. It only shows what he has on the progress when the second quarter happened. It was Saturday night. Uh -huh. Let's see. No, it's just really, really they have been watching Fella House all day. No. All right. 
At every muted. So let's see. Let, let, let's do this based on raised hands instead. Um, so I see we have Julie with a raised hand. So you are hopefully unmuted now, Julie. Yes. So um, I asked this in another school net meeting and make a custom report. I can't figure out how to get it in a custom report, but um, a lot of our teachers are creating school net assessments and um, they are either exceptionally hard, um, meaning mostly all high level questions, and then a lot of them are making uh, school net um, assessments that are all very, very basic level questions when we pull individual assessments. And what I'm trying to do is get our teachers to see that there needs to be a mix of those questions, but I can't easily pull that data um, or I can't figure out how to pull a report with that data so I can show them that like, yes, your kids are doing really good on these um, informal quizzes that you're giving, but then you make this test and it's all higher level and that's why they're all failing it. Um, and so I wanted to know if there was a report or if someone could teach me how to build a report that I could show like in this standard, you've only used low level questions. And that's why it's not computing to our check-in data or it's not computing or, you know, going along aligning with our other data. That's an interesting one. Um... I wonder, does the, I don't think the item analysis shows question level, does it, Catherine or Lisa? No, well, my first question is, or that I was thinking about, uh, was the, are the items tagged? Are, are you using items from the bank that are tagged with DOK levels, or are the items that the teachers are creating, do they have a level? Because if the items do not have that property denoted, then there, we wouldn't be able to report on that at all. Um, so Most that's the first them question. Do, but not all of them. Um, I don't, that's not one of the things when the teachers are like making an assessment that they're looking for, um, even okay. though I'm trying to get them there. Um, but a lot of times they do have at least it might not always be DOK. Sometimes it might be Bloom, but we can still okay. say, you know, in the different areas. So I'm okay. just trying to get them to see that, like, even if it's not DOK, which is what we're using in our district, if it's got Blooms, it still fits into, you know, one and two still fits into this one. Um, but they're not looking at it now. So Sometimes there aren't any levels, but most of the time, the questions they choose from the bank do have levels. It's not like they're creating their own questions. Um, they're definitely just choosing questions from the bank. Okay. Um, I know that on the answer sheet, uh, if you print the answer sheet for a test, uh -huh. it does print out the DOK level. So it it's not correlating with the student results, but that's a quick look from the test detail page that would show you, um, hey, all these questions are a level one kind of scenario that you're speaking mm -hmm. about, or all these questions are a level three scenario. Um, so that's the first place um, to analyze an assessment that I, I think I would look um, to see that um, in, in a quick one page response sheet, um, it would show that. Um, I, off the top of my head, I, I believe in a custom analysis spreadsheet report, there is that option, but I don't wanna speak to it until I played with it and made sure that I could pull that information. Um, if you, uh, somehow put your, I don't know, uh, you can reach out to John and he'll send me forward your information to me. Is that okay, John? And then I can respond. Yeah, back. absolutely. Okay, great. And, Thank and I appreciate that. Um, my, I know on the, on the individual tests, um, I just want them to see like over the last 
10 weeks, 12 weeks that we've been in school, they're the data is so different. It's not that the check-ins aren't aligned or even that our curriculum's not aligned. It's that the tests they're making aren't either rigorous enough or aren't aligned. And so I want to show them that as a whole because individual tests I can, but, um, and, and we've got it only happening in certain like whole grade levels, right? Because they'll come together and this person will make um, the test for all of the reading. So then all of the reading tests are low level and then all of the math are high right. level because another teacher's doing it. And then science is all across. So um, I'm trying to show them that like, we've got to do something different as a group um, and they're not getting it right now as, um, individual tests. I need to show them like the compilation of like all of these tests and how that's not aligning to where our end goal is. Um, but I, I have used the the answer sheet um, individually with them and it just hasn't unfortunately made the impact I needed to make. Okay, okay, got it. I understand. <laughs> But I appreciate you looking into it more for me, but that was my question. Thanks. Sorry. Okay, great. No, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good one. I think I hadn't thought of that, but I, I can definitely see the value in being able to pull something like that. So hopefully we can, we can figure something out. Um, so do we have anyone else who would like to throw something out there? Um, feel free to type it in the chat or the Q and a, or if you want to raise your hand, I can unmute you. Um, you should have a raise hand option. If you go to the participant list. Down toward the bottom, right? I believe at least for me, there's a little like megaphone icon you can hit. And put in some sort of feedback. I will keep an eye out for that. Um, and since we do seem to be, um, let's see, I th see we have maybe a challenge on creating interactive questions like multiple hotspot and things like that. Um, so I will mention um, the October SchoolNet webinar went into that. Um, so if you go to our SchoolNet Google site and go out to the recorded webinars link, um, the October 2020 webinar, I did go over creating a couple of those more interactive questions like the multiple hotspot um, question and a few of the others. Um, so that October webinar does go through that. Um, and I do also have over on the documents page in the training presentations, um, the slide deck from that webinar. So that'll go through that as well. Um, and again, you are welcome to recycle that presentation however you want, whatever you need, go for it. If it is on this site, it is for you to use however you see fit. So we seem, oh, never mind. Let's see. Uh, and we have a question about reminders in advance to register for this home based meetup school net session. Um, so we do always send out the invitation through the NC SIS listserv. Um, and I also sent all the school net leads a reminder yesterday. Um, next time around, I will make sure um, it, it will, of course, go out through the NC SIST listserv. Um, and I will shoot you guys as school net leads a heads up on that as well. Um, so, and that invite usually comes out at least a couple weeks beforehand, if not more, and has all of the registration links for the different sessions. Um, I'll mention you don't necessarily have to register beforehand. Um, you know, you can register the morning of and then log right in. So don't worry if you miss the registration, but you see the invite, you know, the day before you're fine. You can get in no big deal. Um, and to check and see if you are on that NC SIS list. Um, so we do send a message out every Friday on that list. And in fact, one just went out today, um, speaking about the topics that we're going to cover tomorrow in the power school session. So if you did not get an email today talking about what we're covering tomorrow in PowerSchool, 
um, you can certainly just shoot me an email, um, and I can see about get you added, getting you added to that. Um, and like I said, I will make sure I send that out on the school net list as well, which I believe is all school net leads. So with that said, I will go ahead and move us to our last slide here. Just a recap of your home base team. We are all here to support you in any way that we can. Um, and over here at the top right of this slide deck is the bit.ly for the feedback and certificate form. So if you click this bit.ly and I will copy paste this for you as well into the chat um that will get you to our nice little feedback form and as soon as you hit submit on this you will automatically get a certificate for attending today with your 0.1 ceu i will note that you will need to turn that certificate into your psu if you want to get credit we do not have it automatically generating credit at this time so we will greatly appreciate your feedback and hopefully you will appreciate the credit. So I will certainly hang out here a little bit longer if, if anyone's like hurriedly typing anything in. Um, this is definitely your time and we are here for you. But if not, we thank you for joining us today. Wish you a very happy Thanksgiving and happy winter holidays whichever ones you may choose to celebrate. Hope they are great. And I see we have a question about the certificate for today's training. Um, so if you follow this bit.ly that I will drop in the chat one more time, um, once you fill out this feedback form and hit submit, you will get an email that has a link out to the certificate for today. Um, and again, you'll need to turn that certificate into your PSU according to whatever local HR PD policy you have. So we seem pretty quiet out there. I will hang out till, let's say, 1135 um, for anything else that may come in. But otherwise, like I said, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Catherine and Lisa and Pam for all jumping in there and helping you, support John. everyone. Thank you, John, for the work you're doing with SchoolNet now. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you.